Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Adon Alam Messianic Congregation. We're go going to go ahead and get started with our uh, service this evening, and we are glad to um, have you with us. Uh, we always explain that as a Messianic Jewish congregation, we are here to proclaim the Jewishness of our Messiah Yeshua, the Jewishness of uh, our New Covenant faith. And one of the ways that we do that is by using Hebrew in our songs and in uh, some of the prayers. Uh, but we will translate the Hebrew because we see ourselves as a community, as the one new man that Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, talked about in Ephesians chapter 2. Jew and Gentile coming together to worship as one. So uh, <clears throat> we are glad to have you with us for this divine appointment that the Lord has established for his people to come together for a Mikra Kodesh, a sacred assembly, a holy gathering. Uh, as we meet with the creator of the universe, we trust that this service will be a blessing to you. And now <clears throat> we are going to begin our service in the traditional way, and that's with the lighting of the Sabbath candles. I'm going to call up uh, Shona Ryder uh, to usher in the Sabbath for us, and we uh, often explain that there are two candles uh, frequently that are lit uh, because we are given two instructions regarding the Sabbath. We are to shamor, uh, to keep or guard the Sabbath. We are to zahor, to remember the Sabbath, lakad show, to keep it holy. And actually, the lighting of the candles is the last thing we do before we enter into the Sabbath because lighting of a fire on the Sabbath is not permitted. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your word and given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Amen. Thank you, Shona. And now uh, we also uh, are in a special time where we are instructed to count. It's called the Sefirat HaOmer in the Hebrew, which means counting of the Omer. Uh, it's the 50-day period between Reshit uh, Kitzerchem, uh, the first of the harvest, the Feast of first Fruits, and Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And we find this instruction in Leviticus 23, verses 15 and 16, which says, You shall count unto you from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the day after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So <clears throat> we're really... Uh, seeing the connection between first fruits and Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Uh, <clears throat> and also, uh, as we uh, count towards that day, uh, it's also sometimes referred to as the 50th day, or uh, Pentecost is a way of saying that in the Greek, so frequently it's referred to as Pentecost. We acknowledge the next day in the count with a blessing, and then we will announce the new day. Baruch atadonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher hastekenu al yedei emunah b'yeshua hamashiach b'tzivanu al sefirat haomer. Amen. Which means, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has justified us by faith in Yeshua the Messiah and commanded us regarding the counting of the Omer. Hayom shiva yamim shehem shavua echad La Omer, which means today is seven days, which are one week of the Omer. And uh, if you count that differently, see me afterwards and I'll, I'll share with you why that's what ours says. Uh, 
Also on our materials table, we're providing suggested scriptures and prayer topics for the time of the counting of the Omer. And you can either take the paper or take a picture of it uh, to have it with you uh, wherever you go on your phones, um, if you have a phone. Anybody got a phone? Okay, just check it. Now I'm going to call up our cantor, Randall Anderson, and ask uh, everyone to please stand as we will be chanting the prayer known as the Shema. Shema is, uh, the chant is based on Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, and in this prayer, once again, as a community, we affirm the oneness, the uniqueness of our God. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew and then recite the English translation, followed by the verses that come afterwards in Deuteronomy 6, together the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai The Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. Be'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Please join me in agreement as we open our service in prayer. Eloheinu veloheavotenu, eloheavraham, eloheyitzkak, veloheyaakov. Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather together, Lord, uh, for these uh, weekly divine appointment that you have established uh, for this time of counting uh, as we look forward to Shavuot and remembering what took place on that day uh, when you sent your Ruach, your spirit, Lord, to lead us uh, as followers of Messiah in all that we do to comfort us in our difficult times. And Lord, uh, we just pray for our Jewish people who are going through a difficult time right now uh, in, in the land of uh, Israel, Eretz Yisrael. Lord, we just pray uh, that you would bless them, that you would give their leaders wisdom, uh, that you would watch over them and protect them and foil all the plans of their enemies. Lord, that you would perform the miracle if that's what it takes to bring the hostages back home safely. And Lord, that your name would be lifted up and you would be uh, revealed as the Holy One of Israel. And Lord, we just seek your blessing on this service, your anointing on the singing, on the dancing, the worship, the praise, the message uh, that uh, we will hear this evening, the, the liturgy of the service, the fellowship time afterwards, all that we do this evening, Lord. We dedicate it to you, and we ask you to use it for your purposes and for your glory. And we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. You may be seated, and now I am going to call up uh, Linda Lewis to bring us our announcements for the week. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And welcome to Adon Olam Messianic Congregation. If you are a first time visitor, please raise your hand so that we might recognize you. If you have not yet received a visitor's packet, please keep your hand raised so that we can get one to you. This Tuesday, May 7th at 7.30 p.m., 
we will be observing Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day. We, rem we remember the heroes and mourn the victims as we commemorate this horrific time in the hope that it will never again be repeated. And the following Tuesday, May 14th, we will celebrate Israeli Independence Day. In accordance with the traditional observance, we will start our service with the observance of Israeli Memorial Day. Acknowledging the sacrifices that makes the continued existence of the nation possible. And now we pray the Lord's blessings upon you and hope that you will feel his sweet spirit as you worship with us. Once again, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Linda. <clears throat> Those are valuable. No, just kidding. And now we will chant the traditional prayer known as the Vashamru, which means, and they shall keep. This prayer is from Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. We will chant the Hebrew of those two verses, and then we will recite the English translation with a messianic paragraph that we have added at the end. Together, the Vishamru. The Vishamru, scriptures we are told as was his custom he went into the synagogue on the sabbath day and stood up to read amen now we are going to enter into the scripture portion of our service i will call forward our ark opener david lewis uh, and ask that as the ark is open that you would please stand the ark is the traditional name for the furniture that houses the scroll known as the Torah, which contains the first five books of the Bible, known as the five books of Moses. It also reminds us, the term Ark also reminds us of the Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of the Lord dwelt.
And it came to pass, whenever the ark went forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord out of Yerushalayim. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Uh, <clears throat> unique is our, uh, yeah, uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unique is our God, great is our Lord, holy and revered is his name. Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom and you are exalted as head over all. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mount. For the Lord our God is holy. Amen. Amen. I will now ask our scripture readers to come forward. He who blessed our fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Stephen, son of Yeshua, and Rebekah, daughter of Yeshua, who have come up to honor God and his word. May the Holy One bless them and their families and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of their hands. Amen. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Torah. Barku et Adonai Hanvarach. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Baruch Adonai Hanvarach Le'olam Bless the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam Asher Bakar Banu Mikol Ha'amim V'natan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Adonai Notein HaTorah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This is the 26th day of the first month on the Hebrew calendar, the month of Nisan, which used to be called... Okay, that was for our visiting family to hear our little joke about Nissan and Datsun. They're probably too young to get it, though. Uh, our Torah reading for this evening is taken from Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 through 12. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Vayikra, and we'll be reading from chapter 17, verses 10 through 12, found on page 129 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. When someone from the community of Israel or one of the foreigners, or as Rabbi I like to say, sojourners, living with you eats any kind of blood, I will set myself against that person who eats blood and cut him off from his people. For the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for yourselves. But it is the blood that makes atonement because of the life. This is why I told the people of Israel, none of you is to eat blood, nor is any foreigner or sojourner living with you to eat blood. Amen. The blessing following the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher natan lanu Torah demet Thakai olam nata betokinu Baruch atah Adonai Notein ha Torah Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, 
who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And now for the congregational response following the reading of the Torah. Vazor HaTorah, Asher Samoshe, Lifnei B'nei Yisrael, Api Adonai, Meyad Moshe, Etz Kayim Hi, Lamakazim Kimba, V'Tor, Moses placed before the children of Israel. It is in accord with the Lord's command by the hand of Moses. A tree of life it is for those who take hold of it, and blessed are the ones who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Turn us, O Lord, to you, and let us return. Renew our days as of old. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Haftarah. <coughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> we got a rookie on the job here. Uh, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chose the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. Our Haftar portion for this evening is from 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 33 through 35. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Shmuel Aleph. We'll be reading from chapter 14, verses 33 through 35, found on page 312 in the Complete Jewish Bible. was told, look how the people are sinning against Adonai, eating with the blood. He said, you have not kept faith. Roll the big stone to me immediately. Now Shaw said, go around among the people and tell them, each of you is to bring his cow and his sheep and slaughter them here. Then eat. Don't sin against Adonai by eating with the blood. So each person brought his animal with him that evening and killed it there. Saul erected an altar to Adonai. It was the first altar that he erected to Adonai. Now, for those of you uh, following along in your programs, that is not the traditional Haftarah portion. The tradi traditional Haftarah portion uh, was from Yechezkel, Ezekiel 22, but all the verses are verses of condemnation, and I just wasn't willing to um, read from those verses. So, uh, not that they don't apply, but we have uh, visitors here who live in Israel, and I just felt like we could pick different verses to read, so I did. Uh, the blessing following the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all ages, righteous throughout all generations. You are the faithful God, promising and then performing, first speaking and then fulfilling. For all your words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words. 
or no word of yours shall remain unfulfilled. You are a faithful and merciful God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who are faithful in fulfilling your words. Amen. Amen. And now the blessing before the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher matan lanu hamishiach Yeshua, Lahani roshel agrit hakadashah, Baruch atah Adonai, Notein habrit hakadashah, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Our Brit Kaddishah portion for tonight is from John chapter 6, verses 51 through 55. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Yochanan Hashaliach. We'll be reading from chapter 6, verses 51 through 55, found on page 1338 in the Complete Jewish Bible. I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Furthermore, the bread that I will give is my own flesh, and I will give it for the life of the world. At this, the Judeans disputed with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Yeshua said to them, Yes, indeed, I tell you that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourself. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. That is, I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Amen. And now the blessing following the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher matan lanu hakivar ha'yimet the Kaiyokam Nata Betokenu Barukata Adonai No Tain Habrit Hakadasha Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and life effort everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. When the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Clothe your priests with righteousness. May those who have experienced your faithful love shout for joy. Hallelujah. For the sake of your servant David, do not delay the return of your Messiah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word in the Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. When the ark is closed, you may be seated. Please join me in reciting, He being merciful. He being merciful forgives iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently he turns away his anger and does not stir up all his wrath. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, 
and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Well, we are in for a special treat this evening. Last week, a congregant contacted me about uh, having a gentleman who lives in Israel coming to speak to us. And as you know, I always try to take advantage of any opportunities to get a firsthand account of what is going on uh, over in the land, especially uh, at this time. So I asked Luke Hilton to come and share with us this evening. Now, by way of introduction, Luke, along with his wife, Olivia, and uh, their tribe of six, um, <clears throat> who I've asked Luke to introduce, because we are certainly glad to have all of you uh, with us this evening, and I think he'll have a better chance of remembering their names than I will. They currently live in Samaria, uh, Shomron in the Hebrew, often uh, uh, called as being, or, or described as being part of the West Bank. Uh, Luke is part of a uh, media initiative called the Israel Guys, which generates weekly videos and articles about what is actually going on in Israel. This initiative is an outgrowth of a ministry called HaYovel. Who knows what HaYovel means? Little Hebrew test. The Jubilee. Okay. Sounds familiar now, doesn't it? Where Luke serves as the marketing director. He also has co-authored a book called Facing Jerusalem, God's Plan for Go Global Redemption. So I am looking forward to being blessed as we hear what the Lord has laid on Luke's heart to share with us this evening. So let's give a warm Greenville, South Carolina welcome to Luke Hilton. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Well, Shabbat Shalom. So yes, I will introduce my family. Um, and they're probably actually going to have to leave in a few minutes because it's getting past their bedtime. So this is my wife, Olivia. And uh, my two oldest children are passing out brochures. They're two different ones. You might want one of each. This is Aliza, Azriel, and then we have Ora, Rena, Ora, Rena, Madeline, and Emmanuel. So yes, that's that's some Hebrew for you. <laughs> um, Shabbat Shalom. And thank you for having us. It's a blessing to be here. So um, I live, my wife and I and our family lives in Israel. We're part of a ministry called Hayuvel. It um, was started by my father-in-law, Tommy Waller, about 20 years ago. They first went to the land of Israel. I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go. Who remembers where they were on 9-11? Everybody, right? Yeah. Well, we were in Israel on October 7th. And October 7th is Israel's 9-11, except much worse, and I'll tell you why. I woke up on the morning of October 7th, and as you all know, it was the last great day of Sukkot, Simchat Torah. It was also the weekly Shabbat. In Israel, all of the media outlets are shut down, the businesses are closed, um, everything's shut down. People are not using their cell phones, the internet's not, you know, people don't use the internet. Um, so the country is more or less shut down, number one, because it's Shabbat, and number two, because it's the Feast of Sukkot, and it's the last great day. So we wake up on the morning of October 7th, about 6.30 in the morning, I happen to open my front door. And I look out and I see military jeeps coming up, of our, coming up our hill, which is not entirely unusual. Uh, we do live in Israel and you see soldiers a lot more there than you do here. But I saw a few more than I normally would. And then I saw a normal civilian car driving up the road, which is very unusual because we live next door to an Orthodox Jewish community. And on Friday night to Saturday night, the gates of the community are shut. No one drives in, no one drives out, no one drives on Shabbat. So I saw, see a civilian vehicle uh, driving up, and then I see our good friend, Avraham Hermon, who is an Orthodox Jew and who has never ridden or driven a vehicle on Shabbat in his life. Not only that, but he has a cell phone in his hand. I see other leaders of the community. Very quickly, we find out something very terrible is happening, but it takes all day long for us to figure out that 
exactly what it is. And even then, it wasn't until Sunday and then Monday and then Tuesday for the details to keep coming in, keep coming in, keep coming in, as I'm sure many of you probably experience here in America. The, the media took a while to catch up to what was happening. I work in media. Uh, we put out videos every single day. The Israel guys, we um, try to tell the truth of what is happening in Israel. We try to cut through fake news and propaganda and the lies uh, that are being spewed forth in the mainstream media. I'm used to, whenever a story comes out in the media, I'm used to it being uh, not nearly as bad as what the media portrays it to be. Or whatever the media says, I'm used to it being many times they, they just flat out lie, they distort the truth. Um, that's what I'm used to. For the first time ever in my experience with the media, the truth was much worse than what was portrayed. October 7th was the worst massacre in the history of the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And not only that, but the media itself was embedded with the atrocities that happened on October 7th. 6.30 in the morning, Hamas, uh, who for once actually was smart and organized and trained and well prepared, invaded Israel by paragliding, by cutting through the fence, by ocean, by ocean coming in boats, uh, every, uh, every possible way you can imagine. They, cut, they took down Israel's communications, took out the IDF posts on the border, cut the fence, invaded Israel, entered every kibbutz and community that they could, and massacred 1,200 people. Now, the world stood with Israel for about three days. And Israel had the world's sympathy for maybe two weeks. And then it flipped. And as you very well know right now, the world has already flipped 180 degrees and is standing 100% against Israel. The college campuses all across the United States are being overrun with pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas, and I would even say pro-Iranian protesters who are determined to not only uh, not only take away Israel's right to their legitimacy and their right to be a, a sovereign Jewish nation, but they're also determined to take down America. I don't know if you've noticed, but they're not just saying down with Israel, they're saying down with America as well. And as I was uh, a couple weeks ago before we hit the road on this last minute speaking trip that we're on right now, a group, a WhatsApp group that I'm on with a lot of Israeli leaders and thought and uh, thinkers, a man named Gedalia Bloom, a friend of mine in Israel, put on the chat and he said, for as you're talking to believers and Christians in the United States, make sure they know it's not only to stand, it's not only important to stand with Israel because of Genesis 12. It's not only important to stand with Israel because God said so. It's not just about what the Bible said or God made a covenant with the Jewish people. He said, make sure they know that these same people who hate us are coming for you next. Because they say first the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. Now I know all of us here might also be Saturday people, but the concept is that the same people that want to take out the Jewish people also want to take out um, America. They want to take out Western civilization. Iran says death to Israel, death to America. They say first the little Satan, then the big Satan. Now, um, speaking of October 7th, many people are wondering how did it happen, right? And obviously, it's a mixture of a lot of different failures, um, failed intelligence, uh, failed leadership, um, the IDA, uh, IDF being distracted and called up to the northern border with Hezbollah and by Lebanon. Um, we still don't fully know exactly what happened. But I will say this. Not only were there miracles that happened on October 7th, but it's a miracle that it wasn't worse than it actually was, because we now know that Hamas was supposed to wait to attack in conjunction with Hezbollah from Lebanon with Fatah, who is the controlling terrorist organization in Judea and Samaria, which is the place that the world wants to make into a Palestinian state. Uh, we know that they were supposed to wait and coordinate, and coordinate an attack with Iran, all at the same time. Iran, Hezbollah, Fatah, Hamas, all attacking at the same time, which potentially could have overwhelmed Israel. Now we know 1948, 1967, 1973, Israel nearly was overwhelmed, but what happened, God always steps in God always stepped in and by miracles saved the day. That doesn't mean, though, that uh, we should not be grateful that they, the Israel was not overrun on October 7th because Hamas jumped the gun. They saw the Nova Music Festival with thousands of Israelis celebrating, and they decided it was too good of an opportunity to pass up, and they jumped the gun, came into Israel, and massacred 1,200 people. Now, 
after October 7th, and maybe you've heard this, but we started calculating some numbers because 9-11 is, is the most relevant thing that I can compare October 7th to for Americans. Um, about 3,000 Americans were killed on 9-11. If you take the per capita, per capita numbers of October 7th, that's equal to four, what happened in Israel on October 7th is equal to 40,000 Americans being killed on 9-11. So we're talking much, much, much worse. Um, so a few months into the war, and I think all of us uh, were probably shook up by what happened six months ago. Probably still shaken up. I will tell you that a few weeks ago, our, my family was scheduled to fly back to Israel um, three weeks ago this Sunday. And that's the day that the Iran attack happened. Our bags were packed. We were ready to get in the van five o'clock in the morning, drive to the airport in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and that night is when we start getting the messages from our team in Israel that the sirens were going off, they were going into lockdown, they were hearing the bombs and explosions, the uh, drones and missiles being shot out of the air by the IDF. And then the worst part of it is that where we live is on the Mount of Blessing, which is in Hebrew Har Bracha. It's in the Shamron. It's one hour straight north of Jerusalem, an hour east of Tel Aviv. It's also the same mountain as Mount Gerizim, same Mount Gerizim from the Bible where Jesus Yeshua ministered to the woman at the well. It's also the same mountain where the same Samaritans that are descended from that woman at the well still live today. And they have the Samaritan village there. So that's where we live. It's right, in, it's right in the middle of four Arab communities, four Palestinian Arab communities. You have Nablus, you have Hawara, which is where a lot of terrorist attacks have happened. You have uh, uh, Borin and, and, uh, and um, Iraq Borin. These four Arab communities went crazy when the Iran attack happened. Our team is hunkered in our, in their, our houses, on our facility. 2 a.m. in the morning, they're hearing the explosions, and then they heard the screaming and the yelling from the Arab communities all around, sounding as if they're about to charge up the hill. Now, it only lasted for about 30 minutes. The IDF immediately responded, restored calm to the area. The IDF had everything under control. The entire attack from Iran was, was uh, finished in, in about 30 minutes. But that attack shook our team up. It shook me up because, number one, I wasn't there, and I wish I was there because, uh, you know, just standing in solidarity because I knew exactly what was happening. I could picture it. My house where my family lives is right there with the rest of our team. But it shook us all up. And um, it just makes it, you know, six months ago we had the massacre on October 7th. Now we have Iran attacking, which is, Iran has not ever attacked Israel historically, and they haven't tried to you know, attack the Jewish people since the times of Esther. And this is just a couple of weeks after the holiday of Purim, right? When, which is the story of Persia, Iran, trying to eradicate the Jewish people. At the same time, I saw a video from Chicago, a group of uh, protesters gathered to educate themselves on how to better um, protest against the Jewish people in Israel. A man from Iran, I assume, decides to teach the crowd a chant in Persian. He teaches them a chant, uh, Mar Bar Yisrael, which in, in Persian evidently means to death to Israel, right? Um, but the crowd, uh, he teaches them the whole chant, they're reciting it, they're practicing it, and then someone says, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to Westerners, English speakers, it means down with Israel. What does it really mean? Death to Israel. And then someone in the crowd says, well, teach us how to say that in Persian except death to America. This is happening in Chicago. Right. This is in America, and that's why I tell you what my friend Gedalia said to make sure, make sure America knows they're also coming after us. We're all what they say. We're all people of the book, Jews, Christians, those who believe in the Torah, the Tanakh, whether we believe in the entire Bible. We're all people of the book, and we have a common enemy. We have a common God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, who made a covenant with his people. Who we are grafted into that covenant through Yeshua, our Messiah, right? But even the Jewish people are now beginning to realize we have to stand together. We have to bond together. Now, um, we're part of an amazing movement called Keep God's Land, a movement who is working with politicians, Christian pastors, Jewish rabbis all over the world to stand together um, and encourage Israel and encourage our American politicians to keep God's land, meaning Israel should not give one square inch of the land, of their land away to their enemies, not Judea and Samaria, not East Jerusalem, not the Gaza Strip, not the Golan Heights, not the Sinai Peninsula, none of it should be given away 
to their enemies. And that movement is growing. Even today, they're writing a letter following up on, on President Trump's statement saying he, they, he basically was renouncing the idea of a two-state solution. Pastors and rabbis all across the world are now signing on to a letter encouraging him to stand more firmly in that. Um, things are moving on both sides. We see the enemy growing stronger. We see the light growing brighter. And it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. Um, but I will say, I went to Berri, which is one of the four communities on the Gaza border that was most horrifically affected on October 7th. This January, four months into the war, our, a war, our team goes to Berri. We have a, a tour arranged with a member of Knesset. We have tour guides that are supposed to take us around the kibbutz. We arrive in the middle of the kibbutz. Excuse me. And we get off our bus, and immediately there was a ground-shaking explosion. So loud and so deafening that literally like people screamed in our group, louder than anything I've ever heard. And unless you've been in the military and in, in an active war zone, you probably can't even imagine these types of explosions. I've been around guns my whole life, you know, I've shot guns. I'm from the South in, in the U.S. Most of you guys are probably the same. Nothing ever, I've never experienced anything like this. Every five minutes, every three minutes, five minutes, you'd hear these ground shaking explosions. Now we were told immediately, that's the IDF, don't worry. They're working in Gaza, it's the good guys. But I mean, it was so close, it made the war very, very real. Um, and then we meet our tour guides who I realized, these were residents of Barry, people who lived there that lived through October 7th. One of our guides, his cousin was still a hostage in Gaza at that very moment. Still is today, as far as I know. Several of his family members were killed on October 7th. Another tour guide, him and his wife and their two small children, hid in the bomb shelter. He's holding the handle of the shelter, trying to make sure terrorists stay out um, for hours and hours before they're rescued by the IDF. Now, you have to understand, bomb shelters in Israel were not made to keep bad guys out. They're made to protect you against an a incoming rocket or, uh, or, or shrapnel or, or, you know, the fragments from incoming rockets and missiles. And that's what they're used to, because on the morning of October 7th, they heard, they heard rockets coming from Gaza, and most Israelis, honestly, in the South said, you know what, it's normal, we go to the bomb shelter a few hours, the idea of gets under, everything under control. It's sad, but that's what they're used to. And that's what they thought, until they realized, no, Hamas terrorists are inside our communities, and they started WhatsApping. WhatsApp is like the, uh, it's like texting in America. Everybody uses WhatsApp. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's just a, an app that they use to message each other. They're calling each other. Our third tour guide that we met in Berry, she takes us to her father's house. The most heartbreaking story I've ever heard. She takes us to her father's house that is just burned and blackened. And her father had one of these electric carts that he would ride around the community in. And she tells us the story of how her father refused to go in his house because he'd always been friendly to the Gazans. He'd always been friendly to the Arabs, right? The Arabs had worked in his community. He knew them. These, these people from Barry had been to Gaza throughout the course of their lives. These were like peace activists, peace-loving type of people. They came in, and I'll try not to be too graphic, but they, they wounded him. He's bleeding. He goes back into his house. Uh, he's by himself, and he calls his two daughters, one of whom is telling us this story. She's in a house, her own house, 100 yards away. Second story, looking out the window towards her father's house, on the phone with him, realizing he's bleeding out and he doesn't have any medical help. And if something isn't done soon, he's gonna die. Now she, she decides, I have to go save my father. She starts to go out her second story window and her neighbors call her and say, no, you can't come out your window. There's terrorists right below you. And then she has to make a decision because her two children are in the house. She has to make a decision. Do I, do I basically jump out the second story window leave my two children here and attempt to go save my father's life who's bleeding out? Or do I stay here and, and make sure my children are safe? And ultimately she, she knew, you know, there, there's not much chance I'm gonna be able to help my father anyways. And she has to stay and protect her children. And she played us the very last words her father ever spoke. They have a, a, a recording of him because he's on the phone with his daughter. This is the reality. And these homes that we visited, visited in Barry were just raw. There was four months into the war. There's no tape. There's no caution tape. There's no, nothing's roped off. We walked in houses where the rubble was two feet deep. There was an oven with the, the oven door open with cookies that were just burnt, that were baking on the morning of October 7th. And the pan had been left there for the last four months. 
the level of destruction. You think 1,200 people were killed, terrorists invaded, right? It's a horrific attack, but like, how bad can it be? I can't, when, I'm, when I was walking through this community, the one thing in my mind was, I will never be able to properly describe how horrible this massacre was. The level of destruction that Hamas went to, they bulldozed houses, they set them on fire. They, hours and hours, they tried to break into a safe room, a bomb shelter that we saw. They didn't have any success, so they went and got a bulldozer and pulled the entire room apart and killed the family. Now, again, like, I don't, I've never, and I've traveled all over North America, I've been to New Zealand, Australia, speaking about Israel, and I've never, like, had a, such a, you know, heavy message to share, and I don't like dwelling on that, right? But when I was in Barry, I realized the world has to understand, they have to know, because there's so much propaganda out there. That, like I said, the, the world stood with Israel for like three days, and today we're, America's being overrun, it's college campuses with those who hate Israel and want to see them eradicated. When they say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, that does not mean they want Judea and Samaria or the West Bank as their own state. It does not mean they want Gaza. It does not mean they want East Jerusalem. It means they want the entire state of Israel, and they want the Jewish people washed into the sea. 100%, every single time. You ask any protester, any pro-Palestinian person, what does from the river to the sea mean? It means from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. They want the Jewish people eradicated. They say, go back to where you came from. Where is that? The gas chambers of Auschwitz? That's the reality. That's what's really happening. You know, um, I'm sure you're all, who here has been to Israel before? All right. A lot of you probably been to Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust Memorial, right? The Israel's National Holocaust Memorial records what is known as righteous among the nations. Righteous among the nations is a non-Jewish person who saved Jews during the Holocaust, right? Yad Vashem records 28,000 people as righteous among the nations. And with that number, 6 million Jews were murdered. Now my question is, during the Holocaust, if there had not been 28,000 righteous among the nations to save Jewish people, how many more millions would have been murdered? 12 million? I don't know. How about if there were 28,000 more non-Jews who saved Jews during the Holocaust? Would there have been less, maybe none, maybe a 1 million, half a million? Because we're seeing those same levels of anti-Semitism today. And I truly believe we're on the verge, even 75 years after the Holocaust, we're on the verge of, of being in danger of the same Holocaust happening again and again. I hate to keep going back to it, but October 7th is the worst tragedy to befall the Jewish people in modern history since the Holocaust. Um, and the, the question is, if we don't stand now, then when? Now, I know I'm speaking to the choir here uh, because so many of you have been to Israel, and I understand you guys support Israel so much. Um, but I just, I, everyone, is, most of us have heard this quote, right? And it was written by Martin Niemöller as part of a poem written just after the Holocaust. He said, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And again, um, I've recently become very actively involved with a large group of Israeli Jews, and, then, and also now more and more Christian pastors and just rabbis from America and Israel joining in. And the, the biggest thing they want America to know is they're coming after you too, and we have to stand together. Now's the time we have to stand together. It's time for us all to throw in our lot uh, together. So, to uh, to tell you a little bit about my own story and the story of our ministry and what we do in Israel. Um, I first went to Israel at age 16, and I grew up as a believer, reading the Bible, a strong conservative family, knew the stories of the Bible my entire life. Um, but they were really, even though I believed them, believed the Bible, believed, you know, had a faith in Yeshua and, and the faith in God, the, the stories and the words written in the Bible were still just words on a page. I went to Israel, and suddenly the Bible I'd been reading my entire life just came to life right in front of me. It became what I call, uh, I call it going from a linear version of the Bible to a 3D version of the Bible. 
And when we, when I talk about, and this is why uh, our faith and our Bible should absolutely be connected to politics and what's happening today, okay? Because 80% of our Bible was either written or happened in a very specific place. You know what that place is? Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Now, where have we heard those three words mentioned before in the Bible? Acts chapter 1. Yeshua was teaching his disciples for 40 days, right? Seen by 500 people, standing on the Mount of Olives. We know, we now know he's about to ascend to heaven. His disciples didn't know that, right? His disciples had been uh, hearing him teaching for 40 days. They saw him come back to life. Then they heard him teaching. It says he was teaching about the things of the kingdom of God for 40 days. Then he's standing on the Mount of Olives and they said, we just have one last question. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, it says, is now the time that you will restore your kingdom to Israel. And he didn't say, dumb question, you missed the whole point. That's not what he said. He said, no, nope, it's not time yet. He said, in the meantime, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, I personally do not think that it was a coincidence that he specifically named three places, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and then he said, go to the uttermost parts of the earth. 80% of our Bible was written or took place in that very place. And guess what the world likes to call that place? They call it things like the West Bank. They call it the occupied territories. And the world is determined to make that place into a Palestinian state and give it to Israel's enemies, to take it away from Israel and give it to their enemies. I call this place Israel's biblical heartland because that's where I first went when I was 16. And I stood in a place called Mount Kabir, Alon Murray which is where Abraham stood in Genesis 12, and God said, look north, south, east, and west. All the land that you see, I'm giving to you and your descendants forever. That very spot, you're looking at the Tirzah Valley, which is where Joshua led the 12 tribes of Israel into the land, and then he took them to a place where if you look to the west, you see Mount of Blessing, Mount of Cursing, Mount Tebal, Mount Gerizim, where Joshua took the tribes to the Tirzah Valley, and they stood on each mountain, and God said, Read the, remember six tribes on each mountain? They built an altar and they read the blessings and the cursings. Everybody answered, Amen. That's all right there. You can see it from where Abraham stood. You go south, you come to Shiloh, Shiloh where the, tower, the, uh, the tabernacle stood for 369 years. You go more south, you get to Bethel, Beit El, which is where Jacob had his dream. You, uh, and I'm skipping so many places. What I like to say is you can't toss a rock in Judea and Samaria without hitting a place straight out of the Bible. Jerusalem. The entire Jerusalem of Yeshua's day is what's considered East Jerusalem today, meaning the old city, the Western Wall, the Temple Mount, the City of David, the Mount of Olives. All of those places are inside the territory that the world wants to, to give away and create as a Palestinian state. There's never been a negotiation that the Palestinians, you know, the so-called Palestinians or the Arabs of, the, of, of different countries have tried to negotiate for their own state that did not include those parts of Jerusalem. You have Judea, where uh, the prophet Amos hung out, where the, the, the sheep for the temple were, were raised, where David raised his sheep, where uh, David hid out in the caves from Saul. So many places where Bethlehem is, where our Messiah was born. All of those places are right here. So at 16, and then when I went again when I was 17, and then again when I was 18, and I've never stopped going since then, and now I live in the land of Israel, my faith just came to life. And I realized that this is one of the keys to the restoration of God's kingdom, is to get this vision for a physical redemption happening in Jerusalem, because Yeshua is coming back to a specific place in Jerusalem, right? And so... The ministry, which was started by my father-in-law, uh, is called Hayovel. He, Tommy Waller, he went to Israel in 2004 as a uh, tag along with a group of businessmen who was invited to go to Israel along with a group of, of businessmen on a trip. While he was there, he felt like God was drawing him to Israel to do something there, giving him a vision, but he didn't know what. While he was there, he was invited to the Mount of Blessing. An Orthodox Jew named Nir Levi took him to the edge of his farm, which was a vineyard. He had vines planted. And he opened his Bible and he read him Jeremiah 31.5, which said, You will again plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. 3,000 years ago, Jeremiah watched Israel, the land of Israel burn. He watched Jerusalem burn. And while Jerusalem was burning, he got a vision and a prophecy from God that one day the physical land would be restored. 
Jeremiah said it, not only him, but Amos said the, the mountains will drip with sweet wine, the oil will overflow in the mountains. Uh, Joel said the same thing. Ezekiel 36 said, the uh, O mountains of Israel, shoot forth your branches, for my people Israel are coming home. You know, the land of Israel was desolate for 2,000 years, brown, and if you were to fly over, I went, last year I took a flight that flew over Israel, stopped in Amman, Jordan, and then went back to Tel Aviv. It's just the way my flight worked out that year. It's a 20-minute flight from Tel Aviv to Jordan. You fly over green, green, brown, and then you go from Amman, Jordan to Tel Aviv, brown, green. That's what happened when the Jewish people came back because Ezekiel said, when my people come home, then the mountains and the land will come back to life. And guess what? It happened. And just in the last 30 years, the areas where we live in went from desolation to restoration because the prophets literally said, the land has to come back to life. They said the flowers will bloom, the mountains will bloom, the vineyards will be planted, uh, the trees will be planted once again. We're now part of a, a, a project called Greening Israel that's planting thousands and thousands of trees on the mountains of Israel. Um, and the other thing is that Isaiah, we found this out later, says the nations will come and be a part of this physical agricultural restoration. So today we bring uh, volunteers from all over the world. We brought more than 3,000 volunteers in the last 15 years from more than uh, 30 countries to come and serve and bless the Jewish people through physical actions. We're talking planting trees, planting vineyards, harvesting olives, harvesting grapes, pruning vineyards, um, and now we're doing things like construction, uh, paving roads, uh, doing helping with security anywhere that the Jewish people need help. We've done sheep herding, which is also part of the prophecy. Um, and and again, I like I, I have limited time, but we could go through uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Zechariah, and all of them talk about the physical land coming to life. And for me, as a young believer, that's where my Bible came to life because instead of just reading about three thousand year old prophecy and just having no no idea at all of what it meant, I was actually reading it and watching it come to life, and then I was actually participating in physical prophecy that was happening right before my very eyes. So after October seventh, uh, and, and right now, whenever there's not a war going on, and sometimes during the war, uh, as much as possible, we still we have seven or eight volunteer programs every single year that focus on different aspects. Some are focused on planting, some are on harvesting, some are on pruning. We have special programs for young people. We have programs that are more focused on a, a tour of Judea and Samaria, but that have volunteer projects mixed in. Um, so every year we're bringing hundreds of people to Israel to experience it for themselves. And it's, it's focused on serving and physically uh, helping the Jewish people with your hands and your feet. And, but you experience the land through that service. And you get to meet the people in their homes instead of just seeing the land of Israel. Uh, from a tour bus and getting a t-shirt set that says, I ran where Jesus walked. Um, you actually get to get out there with the people of Israel and work with them and meet them and hear their stories. These guys are heroes. And I could tell you miraculous story after miracle story um, that has happened in Israel that just proves that God's word is true and that God is doing amazing things in the land of Israel. After October 7th, um, we literally within days we were trying to figure out what is our personal response and so many people have all over the world jumped in and said what are we going to do i'm sure you guys you know everybody has done their part we've all like prayed we've given money right people have gone to israel so after after, after a few days into the war we were like okay what is our part and um we decided we we started getting phone calls from all of the leaders in the area and farmers and small jewish communities and they said listen all of the military aid is going to the IDF, as it should, because Israel called up 300,000 reserves and 350,000 people showed up. Mm -hmm. Israel's the only country in the war that increases in population during wartime. Every single airplane flying into Israel was full um, because every Israeli jumped on an airplane because every Israeli is a soldier in the IDF um, because they all do three years of service and then they're reservists well into their 40s and some we have a friend who's 96 years old and he's still a reservist in the IDF um, he's a he, he's a hero from Israel's in the war of independence um, but we started getting phone calls and they said listen all the mil the gear is going to the military we're unprotected because you got to understand in Judea and Samaria there's 500,000 half a million Jews living in Jewish communities right sprinkled in like I mentioned 
with Arab communities that are nobody knows because they have a terrible they, they have such a corrupt government that they don't keep a proper census but a million and a half to two million Arabs probably somewhere in that region and like I mentioned there's four Arab communities around where we live so they said if October 7th happened here, it would be much worse because Gaza had a fence with Israel. Here, we don't have fences. They, we're just, we drive the same roads together. Um, we, you know, one of the roads we drove until recently was the road that went through Hawara, which is an Arab town. And you know, two of our good friends from the community where we live were murdered just last year in that very town. Um, they said, we need, our, civil, our security teams need proper equipment. So we started a project called Operation Itai, and I'll explain that story in a second. Um, to bring critically needed equipment and supplies. And it's all uh, non-military, but we're bringing things like protective vests, helmets, flashlights, drones, um, anything and everything that they needed. They gave us a list and they gave us all the communities and the farms that needed it. And we said, yes, we'll, we're, we'll raise the money. We'll bring it in. To date, we've raised about three and a half million dollars, which is just mind blowing for us as a small organization. It's far beyond anything we've ever done before. Um, we brought in, I think, over a thousand vests and helmets so far, uh, dozens of drones, um, hundreds and hundreds of flashlights and binoculars and uh, medical supplies, things like that. We also put in security gates. We put in security high level and high end security cameras. And right now we're in the process of bringing a lot of uh, thermal and night vision equipment into Israel. Um, it's just a lot more regulated, so it's a slower process. But we called it Operation Etai because there's a story, and I believe it's in Chronicles, um, that talks about how David, when David's king, he, Absalom, his son, decides to rebel and attack him, right? And David ends up fleeing from Jerusalem. We all know that story, right? So the day before that war breaks out for King David, this guy comes from Gath with 600 men. Now, anybody know where Gath is? Yeah. Right there beside Gaza, okay, right? It's basically Gaza. So basically you have a Philistine with his 600 men comes to Jerusalem and he tells David, my, me and my men are joining you. We're, we're attaching ourselves to your army. And the next day war breaks out and David finds himself fleeing. And what happens? David turns to Etai and he says, listen, you just got here yesterday. Take your men, go home. Or if you want to stay and just serve Absalom, that'll work out fine. You don't need to share in my fate. I don't even know if I'm going to live to the end of the day. Go home. Etai says, no, I'm with you, we're going to stay. Basically, the same thing that Ruth said, my people are your people, you know, your God's my God. And what happened? Uh, a few weeks later, or a short time later, uh, Etai and his men are part of one of David's three generals and fighting with him and his army, right? Well, when the war broke out, we decided that we, want to be, we wanted to be Etai and his men. We wanted to stand with Israel, we wanted to stay in Israel, and we wanted to bring in as much supplies and equipment as we could. We even brought in some people during the war. I don't know if anybody heard about the cowboys that went to Israel. Um, they were kind of like a viral sensation, but those, we, we brought those guys in. Um, the most viral thing I've ever experienced, I like organized all of their interviews from them. I mean, it was like midnight in Israel, we're doing interviews on Fox and Friends and News Max and News Nation and like, News, Fox Digital, Fox, every, every show you can imagine, these guys were on it. They were walking, they came to Israel to work during the war and to help the Jewish people, and they ended up walking through Jerusalem just taking selfies every five feet with Israelis because they're so <laughs> famous. Um, and even like three months into the war, because they stayed for three months, because I, I, I didn't actually like go, to, go out in public with them until three months into the war, and like they're still getting stopped every 10 feet in Jerusalem because they were so... Uh, and I realized what it was is number one, it's just iconic when a, a guy from Montana who can ride a horse and ride a, a uh, and ride a bull, which these guys did, uh, show up in Jerusalem with wranglers and boots and cowboy hats, which they did. Um, and then they go viral on top of that. It, it just, and Israelis are like, everybody left us, war breaks out, the world hates us, and we got cowboys from Montana showing up. They just loved it, absolutely loved it. And to this day, I've seen more cowboy hats and cowboy boots in Israel than I ever have in my life. Um, so during the war, we, we, they actually built a horse ranch, which is a therapy center for children, which is amazing. Um, we, they've, we've built different construction projects, put in roads, 
put in security gates, cameras. Um, we've we helped with the olive harvest, which was about to be lost because of the war. Every every business owner in Israel lost their workers because they all went to fight. And then we had a lot of friends that were fighting in Gaza, a good friend fighting in Lebanon. Um, it, which it's ironic. They told us, you know, everybody's waiting for war to break out in Lebanon. Our friend, who's a medic on the Lebanon border, he's like, listen, we already have war. There's no such, like, we're not waiting for war to break out. There's been war for weeks already. Every day, like a good friend of ours who's a believer, actually, a messianic in Israel, he's like, we have a base on the Lebanon border. One day, everybody's, I think it's because it was too hot. They decided we're going to pitch our tents a couple hundred yards outside the base kind of sleep out in the open air like the next day their base gets bombed and like if they had been there everybody would have been killed um that's just one out of like tons of miracle stories i could tell you even from october 7th too um friends that have been fighting in gaza and i was and again whatever the media says like these soldiers friends of ours could they will tell you it is everything you're seeing in the media is false so much propaganda so much fake news um, and it's just the way it flies around so fast. I mean, things I see personally on a day-to-day -day basis. We, we put out videos every day. It's called The Israel Guys. Everybody got a flyer if you want to watch us or you know listen to our podcast or watch our videos. Just check it out every day. We're coming out. One day, we actually caught a fake riot on camera. This is before the war. A fake riot. There was hundreds of Palestinians lined up with burning tires, fires, all the masks, the kafiyas, right? Um, images you've seen on CNN probably every week. And they have ambulances showing up, they're loading people up, and they're throwing rocks and rioting at an empty road. There was no one there. And we decided, well, let's capture it on film. So we actually showed the rioters and the empty road. But what else did we show? All the mainstream media, I'm talking Associated Press, I'm talking all the mainstream media with their cameras on the side of the road pointing towards the rioters, not showing the empty road. There wasn't even, the IDF was like way up on the side of the hill with where we were with our cameras, just kind of watching, because they're like, ah, let them riot. They're not causing anybody any harm, right? That's what's happening. The Al-Shifa hospital bombing that you probably heard about in Gaza, yeah. entirely fake. There was one little rocket that hit a parking lot next to the hospital and it made a hole like this big around. Nobody was even killed from it. Um, and what did the media report within minutes? 500 children and innocent civilians killed. Like, it is everything, they, what's, it's what they call Pollywood. They're actually, they set up fake scenes and I have actors that, and I'm not making this up at all. Like, this is personal experience. Friends of ours who are fighting in Gaza, they see it on an everyday basis. Uh, this is the reality, and again, I could go on and on and on. Um, we, we actually have the privilege of housing soldiers for the first four months of the war. And I'll just tell you, because Israel took their active duty military and sent them to Gaza or Lebanon, they also took reservists, but a lot of the reservists got sent to our areas in Judea and Samaria, and basically they're there to make sure nothing breaks out, right? We're talking, you know, anybody from 25 to 45 years old showing up, leaving their families for four months, living with us, and of course we tried to give them all the coffee they could ever want and you know food whatever they wanted comfortable beds um, and these guys were just amazing you know one Shabbat we actually hosted all their their wives and children to come spend Shabbat with us um, because they hadn't seen him like every two weeks they get to go home for like 24 hours and that's it um, but what these guys would tell us is every night they would go on missions and a lot of times Israel's intelligence they say okay we have these terrorists we got to arrest and they go down into Nablus or Shechem or different Arab villages and make arrests and they would then they would tell us they would say at night we go down into hell and in the morning we come back up into paradise because we live there and it's like we you know we have a comfortable housing for them we have a coffee shop all of our children are running around happy so we're able to be a blessing um, to them I'll close with this because I don't want to go too long uh, tonight there's a verse in Isaiah Isaiah 52 7 that says how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, of ha who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now, I think for 2,000 years, the Jewish people in Israel specifically have seen a lot of hatred um, from believers in Yeshua, but the, the little key piece that's been missing is believers in Yeshua coming alongside the Jewish people and saying, no, we also believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We also believe in the scriptures. We believe that he made a covenant. And as Isaiah said, 
We're supposed to stand alongside them and say, your God reigns. And we're supposed to do that with our physical feet and our actions. And that's what we're dedicated to doing is blessing and serving the land and the people of Israel through our hands and our feet, being the feet, uh, being the hands and feet of Yeshua to serve and not to be served. Um, so that's what we're doing. I do want to invite everyone and gave out some flyers. Sir, Hayovel is serveisrael.com. We have uh, volunteer programs and tours to Israel every year, all year long. And uh, even if a war is going on, we might, you know, if it, depending on the situation, but for the most part, we keep our trips open as much as possible. Please come visit us in Israel. Come join us on a trip. We also have a conference that is very soon. It's May 20th through 22nd in Nashville, Tennessee, um, which I'm not sure how far that is from here, but not too far. I know that. And we're bringing a lot of these pioneers and heroes from Israel, some of whom have been fighting in Gaza. Um, and they're coming to Nashville, Tennessee to share the beauty and the truth of what is happening in Israel and the beauty of the land of Israel with America. We're bringing together hundreds and hundreds of people from all across America uh, to come together and stand and make a bold declaration that uh, Israel should be sovereign. Israel should have the right to defend themselves and we're not afraid and we're standing together. Um, and so there's flyers for that. And also the Israel guys are videos, podcasts, articles that come out every single day. And we'd love for it to have you uh, listen. So thank you guys so much for having me. I will uh, definitely be around for a while afterwards. And also um, there's more flyers back there, but I also brought a couple of our books. One that I was privileged to help co-author called Facing Jerusalem, God's Plan for Global Redemption. And a no more recent book written by my brother-in-law and our executive director, Rereading Matthew, Blessing Israel and Destroying Anti-Semitism. They're easy books, um, but they're just from our personal experiences in Israel and our heart for Israel. And they're back there on the table. Um, I'm not selling anything tonight, so you're welcome to take a copy. If you'd like to leave a donation, that's totally fine. But please feel free to take a book if you'd like it. Take more flyers and brochures. Thank you guys so much for having me. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for sharing, Luke, and uh, I was trying to figure out which is better, his Hebrew or his English. Um, <laughs> his English seemed pretty good for somebody who's been living in Israel for a while, but I I'm just joking. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure his, his, both his English and his Hebrew are probably better than mine. But um, <clears throat> I want to encourage you to, to go by his table, uh, talk to Luke and, and what he's doing, and like I said, it's it's... Uh, to me, every opportunity we get um, to, to get that firsthand account and, and gain a better understanding of, of what has taken place uh, in the land that God has given to the Jewish people uh, is a tremendous blessing. And we, we are certainly glad that circumstances worked out uh, such that Luke was able to, to come here and share. Now I'm going to call up Randall Anderson. Uh, to pronounce the traditional blessings that we recite at the end of the service. The Kiddush and the Hamotzi. Kiddush comes from the same root as Kadosh, which means holy. And in the Hamotzi, we thank him for his provision. And uh, we've got a new tradition that I remember about half the time, which is we all can kind of say the blessings along with the cantor. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Lakayim. Lakayim. Which means to life. <clears throat> Just like Ted is saying it. <laughs> Arukata Adonai, El Heinu Melek Havalam, Hamotzi Lekim Ni Haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread and all manner of food from the earth. Amen. And with the words of our Lord and Savior, 
Anuki Bu Lekim Akaya. I am the bread of life. Amen. I think that was our covenant portion tonight. Thank you, Randall. And now I'm going to ask everyone to please stand as we are going to pronounce the blessing found in Numbers chapter 6. These are words that the Lord told Moses to have Aharon, Aaron, the first Kohen Gadol, the first high priest, to, to pronounce these words of blessing uh, from the Lord over his people. So we encourage you at this time to stand and receive the blessing of the Lord. Yevarekaka Adonai Vayishmareka Ya er Adonai Benavaleka Vekuneka Yisa Adonai Panavaleka Vayasim Laka Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine on you and show you His favor. May the Lord lift up His face toward you and give you His peace. Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Messiah Yeshua, may we all go in peace. Amen. Amen. Now we'll have our closing song. It's where we get the name of our congregation. It's a traditional song in Judaism that proclaims the uniqueness of our God. And um, <clears throat> we'll sing it in the Hebrew, just like I did in the synagogue growing up. And then we sing it in the English afterwards, just like I didn't do in the synagogue growing up. So you'll know what, what the words in Hebrew mean. The Adon Olam. Adon Olam, Masher Malam. Beterim kol yisir mitra Le'enasam pekev soko Atanele shemo nikah Le'akare kilo hako Lavadon yimlo tova Fadu haya, fadu hove Fadu yinye gertifala I'm 
to his care. Asleep, awake, for he is near, and with my soul, my body too. God is with me, I have no fear. Amen and amen. God bless you all for coming. Uh, remember, go by the table and thank uh, <clears throat> Luke has offered to not want to do any business on Shabbat, but there's an offering box there if you want to uh, support the work that he is doing. You can just uh, put it in there if, on the outside of the envelope, put something that lets us know that that's who it's for if you're giving cash. Uh, and remember this Tuesday, uh, Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, and uh, just have a great week. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for all had a part in the service. Shabbat Shalom.